The following message is by Pastor Eric Ludy. More information about the church at Ellerslie is available at www.ellerslie.com. Now, I don't know who wouldn't get excited about that title. Look at that, Hero Training. If I was going to give you a brief peek into what I would define as a hero, it's someone who is willing to forsake their own skin, their own comforts, and put themselves in harm's way to defend or to rescue someone in danger or something that's vulnerable. In other words, they forget about themselves because they see a higher priority on the vulnerable person. And they're willing to put themselves in the danger to protect that person. And we would say that's a heroic act. Well, how do you train for this? Because every single one of us that hears a description like that says, yeah, I, I want to be that person. But there is nothing naturally wired within us that would put ourselves in harm's way to protect someone weaker than us. It just, we don't pop out of the womb this way. And so the concept of hero training is basically what we could say, the work of the Spirit of God upon the life, the soul, the mind, the being of a Christian man or woman. This is what God produces. God produces heroes. Okay, so... You know, make fun of the term all you want. But I am interested in a Christianity that is triumphant. I am interested in a Christianity that shows itself on earth as a demonstration of heaven. And this is Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ do? He stuck himself in harm's way and took the blow that was rightfully ours. He was a hero of heroes. And so he trains us in the same mindset and the same model. Okay, so I get excited about this message, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, this is a quote before I go into it here because it doesn't have... This is a quote that I sort of stumbled upon this week because I was looking into buying a set of very old books for Hudson. Hero training is a big part of my mindset as a father for my son. And, I, you know, I feel like I got dealt a pretty good hand with my father and how my father trained me. But there are certain attributes or qualities. I'm somewhat of a suburban boy. Okay, I'm not a rough and tumble, go live in a tent type of guy. And I would like Hudson to have a little more of the rough and tumble, live in a tent and, you know, shoot a pheasant type of manhood than I have. Okay, I, I'm missing a few of those qualities. Okay, so the concept of hero training as I'm developing and training Hudson, you know, is, is always in my mind. And I would like to have him go further and deeper and beyond that which I have. Okay, so... There's a set of books that I've been sort of poking around at, and I was looking into buying them, and, and in the process, I came across a quote by the author, okay? And it's perfect for this message, okay? So that's what I'm going to read. R.M. Ballantyne said, Boys should be inured from childhood to trifling risks and slight dangers of every possible description, such as tumbling into ponds and off of trees, etc., in order to strengthen their nervous system. They ought to practice leaping off heights into deep water. They ought never to hesitate to cross a stream over a narrow, unsafe plank for fear of a ducking. They ought never to decline to climb up a tree to pull fruit merely because there is a possibility of their falling off and breaking their necks. I firmly believe that boys were intended to encounter all kinds of risks in order to prepare them to meet and grapple with risks and dangers incident to man's career with cool, cautious self-possession. Okay, now what guy in here doesn't like that quote, okay? That is the ultimate quote for a young boy. That's not necessarily what I was dealt when I was a little kid. It's like, no, no, we don't climb that tree because you may fall out and break your neck. So Eric didn't climb that tree, or actually I had to come down from the tree because I really wanted to climb the tree, but I couldn't, especially that one branch that went out and it was a little thin, I really wanted to climb out on that branch. But when I started going out, and then my mom said, no, Eric, you need to get off of that branch because it may break. Oh, there is a part of us, especially as young boys, that wants to grapple with danger. But oftentimes, we are trained out of it. We are trained not to put ourselves in difficult and dangerous situations. And we train ourselves, in a sense, in the opposite direction. To preserve life instead of risk it. 
Now, most of you in here are saying, why in the world would you train someone to risk their life? Now, I'm not talking about bungee jumping necessarily, but I'm talking about a willingness to put yourself into more uncomfortable and dangerous situations as a training platform for a young boy so that as he grows, he is trained for what a man is called to be. And a man is commissioned to put himself in harm's way for the weaker. Now, when I sit down with the guys, in fact, week one of Ellerslie, we, we have guy time. And we get together, and the first principle of manhood that I bring out is the concept of the first sufferer. Jesus was the ultimate man, and he was the first sufferer. The first sufferer is the one in any dangerous situation that knows it is his responsibility to bear his chest and take the hit for those around him. That's the father in any home. If the big meanie is banging on the door, hey, I want to come in and hurt someone in that house. Well, guess who is responsible in that home to put himself in harm's way and be the hero? If that father shoves his wife in front of him and says, "Uh, uh, honey, could you take care of this? I'm going to take the kids into the basement. There's something disgraceful about that. Because we know that the man is supposed to be the first sufferer. It's ingrained in our understanding, even though it's not necessarily practiced before us in a generation. Men are called to bear their chests to the dangers of society, to relieve, to rescue, and to secure the health of those that are weaker around them. That's hero work. That's what we're built for. But we're not necessarily trained for it. So I'd like to sort of poke at some of the reasons why this gets trained out of us. Okay, this is a title to a little subsection, but I am actually giving a statement that comes straight out of Scripture. Do not be careful. Have you ever heard something similar to that but very opposite of that in your life? Known as be careful? Did you know the Bible actually says the opposite? Do not be careful. Okay, now I'm going to give a little context to this, okay? Because if some of you ran with this, especially the little boys in here, they're like, yeah, did you hear Eric's sermon? And now some of the moms are starting to panic here. Do not be careful. Be careful for nothing. Who said that? The Apostle Paul said that. Come on. Paul, you know, you're going to mess with our lives if we actually followed something like that. Do not be full of care. Now the word that I will introduce you to is miramnal, to be anxious, to be riddled with concerns, to be troubled with care. You are not supposed to have a speck of this in your life. There is not supposed to be any reticence based in fear in your existence. There is not supposed to be anything that would lead to what we oftentimes know in our culture as anxiety. Anxiety is not a part of the believer's life. Now, I know it's probably been a big part of your life, But I'm saying it has no basis. You cannot find anything in all of Scripture that will support its existence in your life. The only thing you can find is the fact that it is a sin because it is a lack of confidence in your God's ability. That's what it is. It's saying, I need to muster up a solution. I don't know if God will come through. What if this happens? And God's saying, hey, look, I'm in control. I'm over all things. Your life is in my hands. Trust me. There is no allotment in the heavenly economy for Maranao to be anxious, to be riddled with concerns, to be troubled with care. Jesus, six distinct times in Scripture, gives the command to be careful for nothing. He says, no Maranao. This is Jesus, not just the Apostle Paul, because you know how the Apostle Paul speaks on singleness and marriage, and some of us are like, well, he wasn't speaking the authority of God, and they try and excuse these things away. Okay, now what do you do with this one? Jesus six times uses the word merimnal very clearly to say, don't have a scrap of it in your life. Now, I didn't, I'm not going to, this isn't my entire message, which is why I just gave you the overview. Matthew 6.25, Matthew 6.31, Matthew 6.34, all translated, take no thought for your life. And he says, don't have a scrap of Maranal. Not a scrap of it. The rest of the world around you has Maranal, but not you. You're my children. You're my saints. You're my believers. You don't have it. 
Matthew 10, 19, Luke 10, 41, and Luke 12, 11. These notes are always available online uh, this week, and so if you want to download these things and have these scriptures, you're more than welcome to find them that way. No merim now, the marching orders for the true believers. Now, I have a, a different message that is called spiritual athlete, and I go through and I say a concept of no akakio, which is no spiritual flat, but the Bible actually says grow, do not grow tired or weary. And I have a whole message on that. And it's like, oh, you're taking some of my base supports in life. I, can, I need to grow tired and weary every now and then. I need to be anxious and careful and fretting. These are just what I live off of. This is my fuel source. And God wants to strip you of your fuel source that you have been relying on and stick himself in as the solution. You're supposed to burn the fuel of God, not the fuel of anxiety. The marching orders for the true believers. No merim now. The Apostle Paul says, I would have you without carefulness. Isn't that an interesting statement? I would have you without a scrap of merim now. Now, this is interesting. I'm about to give you context in this, but before I do, I'd like to just explore this a little further and keep pressing this button. Because as of right now, I've basically made the statement there is no place in all of the believer's life for anxiety, for care, for, for anxiety, or I'm sorry, fretting and for foreboding. None of it. It's not allowed. There is no allotment for it where God says, well, you can have that much. At least you're, you're not past the allotment. You know, when it gets to this point, then it's called sin. You're not supposed to even have a scrap of it in your life. Okay, now I'll give you some context for this. But first, I'd like to press a few more buttons. No Miram now, a life that is not careful for anything as Joshua's, who took a band of wilderness dwellers and sought to take down 31 hostile empires for the glory of God. As Caleb, who at the ripe old age of 85 scaled the mountain of giants and expelled the three most dreadful and powerful giants in all the land. As David, who strolled into the valley of Elah and took on the greatest warrior in his generation in hand-to-hand combat with nothing but a slingshot and five smooth stones from the brook. Okay, 31 hostile empires are sitting in front of you. What does your mom tell you? Uh, honey, be careful. What does God say? No, Miram, no. I've commanded you, take the land. What you're going to see is a theme throughout Scripture is that God never causes his people to be careful. He never commands them to be careful. He never says, watch out. There are certain things he does say, and I will go into that. But I want you to realize he, in the wisdom of heaven, does not counsel his children to be anxious. He doesn't say, measure the, the ones you are up against because they are so big. He says, I'm bigger than anything you will face. No, Miram, no. Start marching. Caleb sees the three sons of Anak, the three most dreadful and powerful, and they're living on the top of Hebron. That's God's territory, right in the center of the land of promise. And Caleb says to Joshua, I want that territory as my own. That's my inheritance. I could just see Joshua. Don't you know who's up there? Three sons of Anak. I'm just as strong today as I was 45 years ago. I want that as my inheritance. And he marches up, and all it says in Scripture is, and he expelled the three sons of Anak. The three sons of Anak were the three greatest giants in all the land of Canaan. They were legendary over all the world. Caleb, an 85-year-old man, goes up and it says he expelled them. That's all it says. David, okay, a giant is sitting in the valley of Elah. Isn't this a good moment for, uh, be careful, David. As Benaniah, who leapt into a pit on a snowy day to tackle a lion and kill him. As Paul, who marched into Leicester without weapon in hand, was summarily stoned and killed, dragged outside the city, brought back to life, and then marched straight back in to finish the job he'd started. As God, who sent his son to earth as a baby, vulnerable and weak, an enemy of the state, hunted and despised, and seemingly illegitimate, without a scrap of self-serving marinal, our God pulled off the most extraordinary rescue operation this world has ever seen and will ever see. God is not governed by marinal. He is not anxious and fretting and foreboding what lies before him and what lies before his people. He says, go and get it. We, on the other hand, are burning a different fuel. We oftentimes are burning the fuel of self-sustainment. 
We are looking for self-preservation. We are looking to protect our skin as opposed to fighting for the glory of God. And when you live to protect and preserve your own skin, you end up destroying the very work that God is intending to do inside of your soul and inside of the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, so I said, be careful for nothing. Well, maybe two cares. There are two things in Scripture that God clearly says we are to take care for. Okay, so for all of you moms out there that were thinking, oh, great, you know, I'm going to have these kids jumping off of ledges, high cliffs, uh, because they're not going to care about anything. There are two things in Scripture that God says we are to be careful for. Okay, this is interesting. Number one, the things of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So we are supposed to be careful for the things of the Lord. We are supposed to have a burden in our soul for the things of the Lord. Listen to this scripture. 1 Corinthians seven thirty two. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. The reason Paul even says that I prefer you to be single is because a single one cares for the things of the, word, the, the Lord. That's the same word, merimnal. In other words, a single person solely devoted to Jesus Christ actually is allowed to have merimnal but not for their own skin, not for their own situation, but for the things of the Lord. The health of Christ's body. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same merimnao, one for another. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally merimnao for your state. There is a, a wiring that God wants to build into the church of Jesus Christ, and that is the things that pertain to the glory of Jesus Christ and the things that belong to Jesus Christ, the church, the truth, the word of God, that we are motivated with a burden and a grievance and a concern for these things. Merimno, all throughout Scripture, is seen as the ultimate enemy to the soul. And then God says, oh, but over here it's just fine. But it's different. It's like, as I've used the term, a fuel source. There is something within us, and it is a desire to protect and a desire to, to wield our energies on behalf of something. But most of us wield our best energies, and we seek to protect and preserve ourselves. But God wants us to wield that same urgency or that same desire in a different direction, and that is for the things of heaven, for the word of God, for the saints of God, that we would carry a care, if you will, for the church of Jesus Christ, for the weak around us, and not for ourselves. The heavenly rule of care, or merimnal. If an errand is commissioned by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, then the rule is just do it. And do it without thought, without a scrap of merinal for your life or for the earthly consequences that may follow. Be anxious only that your Lord receive his due. If you're going to have any anxiety, it's that Jesus Christ would receive what is rightfully his. That is your care. That is what motivates you, if anything. But if God has commissioned you forward, you don't measure the 31 empires. You don't measure the difficulty. You don't weigh it in a a list of pros and cons. If God commissions you forward, as as Oswald Chambers says, when obedience is in the ascendant and we deliberately choose to obey, God will tax the remotest star and the last grain of sand to assist us with all his almighty power. No, Miram, no. There's no self-preservation. You stick your neck out for the glory of God. The consequences that follow, that depends on what God wants. That isn't your business. Your business is his glory. That is your concern. That is your care. Number two, if the things of Christ, i.e. the body of Christ, the word of God, the truth, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the weak, are under attack and in need of help, carry the burden, the miramnal, as if you were in Gethsemane. You know, that's what Jesus carried in Gethsemane. He carried the miramnal for the sins of the world. He carried the grief. He carried the anxiety. He carried the full stress and weight of it. It was not for himself. It was for us. He carried the merimnal. And you were invited as a believer to carry the merimnal too, but not for yourself, 
but for others. And I just gave you the list. The body of Christ, the word of God, the truth, the poor, the orphan, the weak, the widow, the lost. If they're under attack and in need of help, carry the burden as if you are in Gethsemane. Allow the weight of God's heart to rest upon your own. Care not about the effects that such a strain may cause you. Only care about removing the strain upon Christ's own and seeing them freed. John Praying Hyde, his nickname was Praying. That's, that's what type of life he lived. This man spent most of his life, his adult life, on his knees praying. The illustration of prayer is so pithy in his life. And he carried the burden or the miram nal of God for the lost in India. That's what he did. He agonized. He wept day in and day out. And there was such a strain or such a miram nal placed upon his heart that it literally shifted from one side of his ribcage to the other. And when he was in his mid-40s, one of his friends says, you need to go to a doctor because he had such intense difficulty breathing and such intense pain in his chest. And the doctor said, I don't know what you're doing, sir, but you need to stop it because it's going to kill you. You have very little time to live unless you totally change your lifestyle. And the friend of John Prane Hyde said, listen to the doctor. And John Prane Hyde said, this is what I'm here on earth for. And I will die with my boots on. John Prane Hyde died in his mid-40s because he was a praying man and because he carried the miram nal of God. If it is you personally that is facing difficulty, remember, we're, we're going through the heavenly rule of care. So the first one is if the Aaron is commissioned by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus, do it. If the, thi- if the things, of, if, if the things of, of Christ are under attack and in need of help, then carry the burden. But if it is you personally that is facing difficulty, i.e. financial challenges, poor health, persecution, etc., don't give way to Merim Nal and spend a moment of care upon it. The rule is no Merim Nal for your own life. If you are to carry Merim Nal, it is reserved only for the things of Christ. But rather, in such difficult situations, rejoice and look heavenward to your deliverer who delights to supply everything needed for triumphant life and godliness. When you have built a pattern of behavior that always immediately turns to anxiety and you take out that precious oil known as miram nal in your life and you burn it for your own self-protection, it kills your soul. Anxiety doesn't help you. It's a lie from the enemy. The enemy says that if you burn the miram nal within your soul, that somehow you are sharper mentally and you'll be able to better apprehend what needs to be done to solve the situation around you. The exact opposite is true. You are dulled spiritually by burning the fuel of miram nal for yourself. If you burn the oil of miram nal for yourself, it dulls you spiritually and you cannot discern what God wants you to do. And God's reaction or his rescue plan is hindered god says faith is what pleases me anxiety merim now is the turning away from god to yourself as a solution instead you rejoice in your circumstances you turn your eyes straight to your king and you burn the heavenly fuel of absolute confidence in him for the things of him, for his glory. And you say, this is for you. Do what you must in my life. Sure, I have a financial quandary I'm in and I don't know what to do about it. Yes, I'm facing physical challenges, but I turn to you as the solution. You can deal with them. You are my answer. I trust you. Miram now, the heavenly oil of care, the fuel source for the poured out life, So what I'm actually saying here, after starting with such a bold statement of saying, no miram now, no miram now, for clarification, for you. There is no allotment for you to burn the precious oil of miram now on yourself. God wants you to care, and he wants you to be burdened, but not for yourself, for your own circumstances. In the whole context in Matthew 6, when he's saying, no miram now, no miram now, no miram now, no miram now. He says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and my righteousness and all these things will be taken care of in your life. 
You turn your attentions and your focus to the things of heaven. That is your job description. Is your, you burn Merim now. You care. You care deeply, but you care about the kingdom of heaven. That's what you care about. And God will take care of you. That's the promise. Your financial circumstances, God will take care of them. Your health circumstances, God will take care of them. All the petty logistical challenges that we as humans face, and I guarantee you every single one of us could come up with a list of at least five to ten serious things happening in our life right now. And I say, no Miram Nal for those things. That isn't going to solve them. That isn't going to take care of them. Jesus is your solution. You focus your life on him. And even though it seems like you're not taking care of things, if I don't focus on that, if I don't fret over it, it's not going to be dealt with. You deal with Jesus. He deals with those things. That's the secret to heaven's answer coming to earth. If we burn our heavenly oil, Miram now, on ourselves, we decay our spiritual man and create space for the enemy to enter our lives and harm us. This is fear-based Miram now. It's anxious, fretting, and foreboding in its nature. If we burn our heavenly oil, Merim Nal, exclusively for his glory, his sake, and his things, then our life grows bright and warm with the glow of God's ever-increasing presence. This is burden-based Merinal, not fear-based Merim Nal. This is burden-based. It's selfless, loving willingness to enter harm's way in order to set right or wrong for Christ's glory. The Christian resolve... This is not about me. This is all about him. My life is not my own. Whatever my God asks for, my God gets. When we talk about hero training, this is what it stems from. This is what builds a Christian hero. I don't really care about other heroes. I care about the heroes that God applauds. That's all that I care about, and especially from a pulpit vantage point. I want to see Christian heroes born again in this world, raised up again to rescue the least, but not for the motivation of self-glory, that they could be seen and known as great men and women, but for the glory of Jesus Christ, even if no one notices them, even if they are forgotten, but Jesus Christ is seen. And for that to be true, it cannot be about you. It must be all about him. And your life cannot be your own. And whatever your God asks for, your God gets. And I've said this before. I don't know if it was in Ellerslie or if it was in church. But I talked about making a decision ahead of time to say yes. Don't wait for the moment when there is a crisis around you or someone that has, you know, their car is broken down on the side of the road and they're going to need help. Don't wait for that moment in which to negotiate what you should do because almost inevitably in that moment, you have something else you need to get to. You pre-decide before you get to those circumstances that you say yes to God. Whatever your God wants, he gets. And that's you primarily. And so you agree with God even before you get to those circumstances where a hero is going to be needed. You say yes before you get there. And that starts today. To say, God, this has been about me for whatever reason. I want it to be about you. I'm willing for you to take this skin, this body and this blood, and I'm willing for you to spend it any way you see fit. Upside down wisdom, preserving God's glory and not your skin. This is based on a a quick little overview of a character known as Joshobium, the Tachmanite, or in another part of Scripture, he's called the Hackmanite. I have no idea why we have to go from a T to an H, but it's translated as the son of wisdom. Joshobium was one of the main mighty men under David. So we have a man who's obviously proving great wisdom. He's the son of wisdom. And so Joshobium the wise... How does Joshobium the wise live? Because everything we're talking about here flies in the face of earthly wisdom. Everything I am counseling you towards right now from this, you know, steel-looking pulpit is actually opposite the world's mentality. 
The world says preserve your skin, lengthen your life, prolong your days. And I'm telling you, don't look to prolong your days. Look for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's all that matters to us. That's all that matters to the church of Jesus Christ, which is why so many throughout the ages have died martyrs' deaths at young ages with great big smiles on their faces is because they knew they were doing something of far greater worth than just living out a long life. Preserving God's glory and not your skin. And this is the number of mighty men whom David had. Joshobium and Hachmanite, the chief of the captains. He lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. Let me read the next one before I make my comment. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, speaking of Joshobium. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Okay. There's 300 enemy soldiers out there. And I've said this to the Ellerslie students more than a few times, so humor me if any of you are Ellerslie. There's 300 enemy soldiers. Now, these aren't just average citizens. Okay, you take Eric Ludy and match him up against, say, four adults, four adult males in a back alley. Okay, and these four adult males are mad at Eric and they want to harm Eric. What are the odds that Eric is going to make it out without a scrape? Four against one. I'm not talking about, you know, Navy SEAL trained. I'm just talking about four average male adults against Eric Ludy. Now, some of you are looking at Eric and going, he's not that impressive. Okay, so you're thinking the guy's not going to make it out alive. Okay, that's four. How about we increase it to ten? Surround me with ten in a back alley. These odds aren't looking good. Now what if we make them Navy SEALs? Ten Navy SEALs against one in a back alley. I'm dead. (laughs) So I'm saying this to give you perspective. Joshobium stands against 300 armed men and destroys them all. Who in their right mind is going to encourage this behavior? You see, we see the end of the story, and we say, you know, that was a good decision, Joshobium. Yeah, that's because we know the final statement. They all died. But none of us would encourage if he he came to us for counsel. Yeah, there's 300 uh, Philistines out there, armed and dangerous. Uh, No one in Israel is willing to stand up against them. Would you mind if I go out and take them? Well, Josh Obin, we really need you here. You're very important to the whole mighty man, you know, thing here that we got going. You know, we're trying to get David to be the king of Israel. We need you, man. No, go. God says, defend the borders of Israel. Israel is under siege. If you see the need, you go after it and know that God armeth the patriot, that God will defend his own. You are doing the errands of the king. Go and fight. So he takes care of 300, and then 800 show up, and he goes right out and destroys 800. Who is this guy? He is nothing more than an average guy from Bethlehem that joined up with David and began to take on the virtue and the strength of his king. That's what Christianity is. It takes average men and women and puts them in absolutely extraordinary circumstances and they demonstrate the heroic heart of Almighty God. And David was then in a hold and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men, Joshua was one of the three, broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Okay, we got, a, we got a Bethlehem, which is garrisoned in by an entire contingent of Philistines, armed and dangerous. We got three mighties who were interested in some sort of a love mission here to go in and get a cup of cool water from the well. This is not a good plan. Every single one of us that is going to give them human wisdom is going to tell them, don't do it. Don't do it. When you get back, I can just see it. David's going to pour it out anyways. (laughs) Don't do it, guys. This is a love mission. They heard the voice of their king. 
And for the glory of their king, for the love of their king, they risk everything. They spend their own lives. I can't imagine what this scene was like, but imagine busting through a garrison to start with. And they're on their, on their way to a well. Could you imagine trying to get that water out of the well while they're standing there fighting off the Philistines? You two take them. I'll get the water. <laughs> now they got this cup of cool water. And they need to somehow make it back out of Bethlehem and all the way to the cave without spilling it. I was trying to walk out of Qdoba just yesterday with Hudson with a little cup of water. And it kept spilling because I had my hands full. I was like, all I was doing is walking just normal. And it kept spilling. How did they do this? Blood splattered all over the place. Blood mixed in with the water. It was a love mission. And seemingly one of the stupidest things that these men could have ever done. The son of wisdom, the Tachmanite. Are you willing to be a Tachmanite in this generation? One that is not motivated by human wisdom, but by the upside down wisdom of heaven that says for the glory of the king. The heavenly rule of hesitation. Never hesitate to sprint straight into danger when God's glory is in the ascendant. This is the believer's privilege and requirement. Now, I wish these were on separate pages so I could stop, but now you can all read on, so I might as well read on too. Always hesitate if you sniff a trap for the children of light. If the strong odor of fleshly bait is in the air, hold back. Watchfulness is the believer's guard against the subtlety of the enemy. Anxiety is not the prescription. Watchfulness is. We are supposed to be vigilant. We're supposed to be watchful over our souls. Not careless. We're supposed to be watchful. So this concept of hesitation, because one of the things we seem to be peeling back is the whole notion of hesitation. In other words, you don't even think about anything. You don't evaluate anything. You just go in. Actually, the scriptures make it very clear that we're supposed to test the spirits. In other words, we don't just accept anything just because it comes from a pulpit in America. It comes from, you know, good conservative Bible-believing pulpit. You're supposed to test it against what Scripture says. Everything. We're supposed to show a degree of hesitation and a degree of care, if you will, in how we handle our souls. So the rule of hesitation is never hesitate to sprint straight into danger when God's glory is in the ascendant. This is the believer's privilege and requirement. I think of Richard Wormbrandt in communist Romania. The communists, the KGB, have come in and they're actually taking every pastor at a pastor's conference. They've threatened them behind the scenes and they say, you get up on that stage and I want you to give the communist message as your doctrine, as your gospel. And basically blaspheme your God. If you don't, we're going to strip you of all you have, throw you in prison, torture you, and kill you. And your children and your wife will live on the streets and there will be no one. If anyone helps them, they will be killed too. What's your choice? And so each of these pastors are proving their choice. Richard and Sabine are sitting in the audience watching this. The glory of God is in the ascendant. Sabina actually turns over to Richard and says, aren't you going to wipe the spit from Christ's face? And Richard says, if I do anything, if I stand up there and say what I want to say, they'll kill me. She said, I'd rather be married to a dead man than a coward. Richard Wormbrandt stood up and wiped the spit from Christ's face and was thrown into solitary confinement and tortured for, I think it was 10 years. Because of the glory of Jesus Christ, what does human wisdom say to us in that situation? Just be quiet. Just be quiet. Don't say a thing. How about that one story of the the little girl in China? I don't know the end of the story. I just remember what happened. But all the class kids were supposed to come up and spit on the Bible. Did you guys ever hear that story? One after another, they're coming up and spitting on the Bible. And this girl comes up, wipes the spit off the Bible, leans down and kisses it. Who's willing to kiss the word of God in this generation? Knowing full well that you will die when you do. That is hero's work. And it doesn't sound like wisdom. I realize that. But it is heavenly wisdom. It's the son of the Tachmanite. That is the sort of wisdom that changes heaven and earth for the kingdom of God. That is what is needed today. If it's spirit, sprint. If it's flesh, hold back. Jesus actually entered the temple with a whip and turned over money tables. 
because he was burdened with the Merimnal of God. He was concerned. He was careful, if you will, for the cause of God on earth. This is my father's house. And he turned over money changers' tables. But there are times when you and I want to turn over mother, money changers' tables, and it's actually the flesh. It's anger, it's frustration, it's irritation. And we want to, under the banner of what we're talking about here, we're saying it's for the glory of God that I'm going to rebuke this person, that I'm going to speak this straight. When in actuality, it's for our flesh. We're mad, we're frustrated, we're upset, and out comes what we could call a nice, biblical-sounding rebuke. That's the flesh. When it's the Spirit... You oftentimes know because it's a lot harder to give. You tremble. You're burdened because it's motivated out of love. And you know you need to speak, but you realize it may cost you your life. If it's the Spirit, you move forward, you sprint to the finish line. You get up, you wipe spit from Christ's face. But if it's flesh, you allow God to harness, temper, and set you down. It is not that time. Don't try and excuse your fleshly behavior under the banner of carrying godly merimnal. There is no allotment for merimnal for you. And I know I'm robbing you from one of your fuel sources that maybe you've burned for years. But the reason I'm saying that and I'm speaking very straightforwardly on that is because that anxiety is killing you. It eats away the soul and it deadens you to spiritual matters. You think you're sharpening when in actuality you're deadening. God has given you that precious oil of Miramnal, but he wants you to use it to be burdened instead of be fearful and to burn it as Gethsemane in your life for the lost, the least, the dying around you. The glory of Jesus, the word of God. The word of God is being trampled upon in the church today. And there should be Miram now that is burning within us over this. There are 148 million orphans in the world without an advocate, without anyone to help them, hidden behind hostile governments that don't want any of us to even reach in and do anything. What do we do about it? There are hundreds of millions of street kids in South America, many of them being hunted nightly by death squads, which are oftentimes off-duty cops for sport. They don't hunt pheasant. They hunt kids without any defense. You should have Miram no that burns within you. It's a burden and it's a care. Don't burn it on yourself. It'll kill you and you will harden you to everything outside of you. But if you burn in Gethsemane with the weight and the burden in the heart of God, you will see this world turned upside down. And yes, you may die in your mid-40s because your heart moves from one side of your chest cavity to the other. But you will die for the glory of Jesus Christ. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the only reason to live. So if you're going to make your life matter for Jesus Christ, forget how long you want to be on planet Earth and forget about what quality of life you want to have while you're here on Earth. Think about one thing, and that is burn in the mirror now for Jesus Christ and his glory. Your life does not belong to you. It belongs to him. So put it squarely in his hands and pre-decide even before you get to that situation when a hero is needed that you will be the hero, that you will be the one to say yes, even though your life may be cut short because of it. This is our privilege. This is our opportunity. Thank you for listening to this message by Eric Ludy pastor at the church at Ellerslie in Windsor, Colorado. Please feel free to make copies of this message, but do not charge for these copies or alter their content in any way without express written permission. More information can be found on our website, www.ellerslie.com. Again, that website is www.ellerslie.com. Know that we are cheering you on as Christ cultivates his set-apart life within you.